Okay. All my fault. Nobody else's fault. Welcome. I'm going to say it so you can hear me this time. I'm Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so grateful you're here. This is a, a beautiful uh, morning uh, that I can, when you can drive to church with your windows down, uh, it's a beautiful morning in April. Uh, many of you, if you were around here for any length of time, I mentioned this this morning, we used to, before this auditorium was built, we used to uh, rent a big tent on this final Sunday in April. We try to catch our college students. We rented a big tent, had about 500 people that we would invite from the city to come. Uh, and we did it for four years. And of the four years we did it, we had one good Sunday. Uh, and so we had one that was like this. We had one that was just beautiful like this. We had one uh, that it was beautiful and sunny, but it had gale force winds almost. So the tent was, was going like this the whole time. We thought, are we going to take off or what's going to happen? We had one morning where it rained and it was like 40 degrees. And so we actually had uh, propane heaters trying to knock the... Uh, we had to squeegee out rain one time. We had a monsoon. And so we decided that we, we prefer uh, an indoor environment over uh, late April weather in uh, Xenia, Ohio. I wanted to commend Chris here. I don't know if any of you, uh, Chris Strong, he's here this morning. I just wanted to commend him for his even facial tan that he has today. Uh, some of you remember when he was working Chick-fil-A, I think it was last year, uh, he had the raccoon tan. It was quite, quite attractive, but uh, now he has the whole, the whole tan. So I just wanted to note that for you today, Chris, and appreciate that. Uh, so he, got, uh, he got, not only got a tan, as Larry said, but he got an even one over his face. So that's a good thing uh, for him. I want to invite you to come to John chapter 21 today. John chapter 21. Uh, just to talking this morning about responding to Easter. Uh, historically, um, many of you, I don't, we often don't reflect on this or think about it, but we're in uh, the period of time that Jesus, historically, if we were back during the time of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, uh, Jesus was still on the earth. So when we concluded chapter 20, it was just eight days after his resurrection. And so here, uh, John doesn't tell us when, but we're somewhere in the 32 days of Jesus' earthly life after his resurrection uh, before he ascends to heaven. So if you want to look at his ascension, you can go to the end of the Gospel of Luke and he'll talk about it and then Luke will pick it up again in Acts chapter 1 and particularly to talk about that. Now Jesus has prepared his disciples that he's going to ascend. If we read in John 13, 14, 15, and 16, he told them that he's going to go prepare a place for them and where he goes, they're going to come also. Uh, but here we're in the, what's often referred to in John as the epilogue. Uh, if you are a, a reader of books uh, and you've ever had a story that you've really, really enjoyed, uh, one of the things that happens sometimes when you come to the end of the book, you wonder, well, there's some things I want to get wrapped up. Will, will she actually marry him or not, right? Will, will they actually get to go to the place that they wanted to go? Well, in the book of John, this epilogue is going to clear up something that if you're a close reader of John, you would be pretty disturbed by as you got here, uh, is up until the end of chapter 20, Peter is a pretty sad figure. And Peter has uh, a demoralized, defeated, uh, disloyal, broken man. And when you come to the end of uh, John chapter 20, what's very interesting, and we'll come back to this, Peter actually comes to the empty tomb Peter, we know, uh, was at, in the upper room when, in the room that was locked when the, the Jesus came. Actually, he'd seen Jesus at least three times since this period of time. But there's never been a conversation between Jesus and Peter. And Peter, all through chapter 20, in those resurrection scenes, right? You remember, he, he runs to the, the uh, tomb. John beats him there. John goes in. He sees the grave clothes laying there, and he sees and believes. Peter just walks in, and we don't know what happened to him. He doesn't respond. And so we come to the epilogue, and the epilogue is going to focus around Peter. But I want to suggest to you that it focuses around what it means to be a follower of Jesus. All the way through the Gospel of John, he said, I've written these things to you that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, by believing you might have life in his name. Now you can read about that right at the end of chapter 20, 
But that purpose is probably twofold because he writes to not only people who don't know Jesus at all. So one way you could read that is, I've written these things that you might come to faith, that you might believe that he is the promised Messiah and that he is God of very God. I've written that. But on the other hand, many of the people that he writes to in the Gospel of John are people who already believe to some degree. They follow Jesus. And so it appears that as here, he wants to take them deeper in their belief. And we know that this is Jesus' intention generally for his disciples because he says, I came that you might have life, and many of you know this verse from John chapter 10, verse 10, and have it to the full. And so Jesus' intention is not merely to rescue people, right? As sometimes uh, Christians get lampooned or joked about, he doesn't come to give people a fire insurance, right? To take hell out of your future. Thank God he does do that. But he comes to give you something more. He comes to give you the life that you've lost in your rebellion against God to restore everything that you've been created to enjoy. And so as we come to this last chapter, I want to read through the whole chapter with you. And then we just want to follow the storyline and reflect on what Jesus does in this. And if you look at your outline, and I hope you'll make use of that in, in your uh, programs. If you look at your outline, you'll notice that the main character is Jesus, not Peter. Jesus is the main character. And what we want to look at is we want to look at how Jesus deals with his disciples. Uh, I, the, the men that we're sharing up here this morning, the last song that we sang, so many things are resonating uh, with uh, what I want to talk to you about this morning, that Jesus tells us about the way he loves, the way he pursues, what his intentions are for his followers. Um, and so we're going to see here, and of course, this is the Jesus who said back in John chapter 10, right, all that the Father gives me, I won't lose any of them. Right, they're my sheep, I'm the good shepherd, and they will follow me, and I will get them to the goal for which I've saved them. John 14, it's the same Jesus who says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Matter of fact, Jesus is the one who has the guest list. He's the one that makes the invitations. And so Jesus determines not only who's going to be in the Father's house, but he's the one that goes and gets the guests to make sure that they get there. So this is the Jesus that's here, and we want to reflect a little bit on Peter's response in particular, because I think Peter uh, is something that is evident in people who reject Jesus, that they want to keep him on the periphery of their vision, but kind of want to wander through their life and not take him seriously. But I also want to suggest to you as believers, one of the things that often happen to us is we get bored. We get distracted. And Jesus gets kind of pushed to the periphery. Uh, you know, the kind of emblem of that, if you think about it, many of us uh, in our homes, we have verses and different things that we put up around our home that remind us of who our Lord is and who our identity is, but they become, after a while, a part of, they might as well be wallpaper that nobody ever looks at. And the only time that you get to reflect on them is when somebody walks in and say, I love that saying, and then you look over and you go, oh, that is up there. I remember that, right, in terms of that. And sometimes that's the way Jesus becomes in our own life. He becomes the wallpaper, and we don't see him anymore. So let me read for you John chapter 21, and then we'll come back and reflect on it. Verse 1, John 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends. Actually, it's an interesting translation here. It's little children. Haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. 
And so Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you you know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that the disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote this down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, if you have your little outline, I just wanted you to follow along with me here. And I want to walk us through the passage and talk about some things that are going on. Now, what happens here is John doesn't tell us explicitly what's going on. They return to fishing. And there's a kind of an aimlessness about them. And John seems to suggest throughout the whole thing that there's an ambivalence toward Jesus, right? An ambivalence is where you have um, a kind of conflicting state of mind. You don't have a clarity with regards to something, right? And the, the ambivalence is seen in a couple of things, right? Many of you, you need to know here that Peter was a part of the inner three, Peter, James, and John. Remember this? Peter was the de facto leader of the disciples. So he was the one that, uh, you know that Peter was the leader, number one, because he was brought into the circumstances uniquely to the three of Peter, James, and John. But whenever Jesus asks the disciples a question, Peter answers, right? So Peter speaks for everybody uh, as the leader, and Jesus uh, apparently uh, wanted it to be that way. So, but notice just a couple things if you're reading the story here. Peter just speaks for himself, and he doesn't lead. He just speaks for himself, he doesn't lead. And then notice when when Jesus comes, the kind of mixed response they have to Jesus. When Jesus shows up on the shore, um, it's John that recognizes him. John is the disciple whom Jesus loved, a leveling title that just says, I'm one of the ones that Jesus loved. He recognized him. Peter didn't recognize him. The other disciples weren't nearly as enthused about everything that's going on. And then they just got awkward exchange. They've got an awkward exchange around the the food. And so they're sitting there and nobody dared to ask him. They knew who it was, but they're all sitting there tongue-tied, right? It's not the thing that you would expect to see if you just were encountering the resurrected Lord. You might expect them to be a little bit excited, right? Might be a little excited right, to see Jesus. So nobody's excited. They're all kind of introspective. It's just awkward. The whole scene, it just lacks celebration. The whole scene is awkward. There's very little conversation, 
right? Peter's the only one that actually rushes to Jesus. Nobody else approaches him. It's kind of an odd sort of setting altogether, right? A, a, a matter of uh, many of you men, if you came home at the end of the day and you had this kind of reception from your wife, you would say, uh-oh, what happened, right? Or you looked at her and you said, I'm not going to ask her a question because it looks like it's not a good opportunity, right? And if you were a person that was afraid to ask a person a question, something's wrong with the scene that's happening here. So what explains the awkwardness of the scene? Were they upset at Jesus? Were they embarrassed, right? Sort of like, you know, your dad comes home if you, when you were young and you were supposed to be doing something else and then he comes home and finds you not mowing the grass, right? So Jesus comes back and he expected uh, them to be active in different things and instead he comes home and they're out fishing. They're out fishing and, and they're a little embarrassed by the fact that, you know, hey, we're out fishing and so they don't really know what to say uh, in terms of that. Were they a little fearful, right? Were they still trying to get around, their heads around? This is a dead man that's now walking here among us, okay? I saw him crucified. This is a dead man. Now, this is one of the things I think we as Christians, okay, is the only way that the resurrection is not just fantastical, nutty, crazy, is if Jesus is who he said he is. And even then, to reckon with the idea that this man came out of the grave is a very disturbing thing if you want to confront it, right? it We don't have categories for that, right? I've done plenty of funerals, and I've been at way too many. I don't know anyone who's walked out of the grave. No, ever. When you go to a funeral, it's, it's over, right? If there was no hope in Christ, right, when the casket closed on my father, that was it. That's the end. No more conversations. No more uh, hunting trips together. No more times to sit around and talk about the Bible together. No calls on the phone. Nothing. It's over. Right? Death silences and ends everything. And here's a person who was definitely dead, who walked right out of the tomb and now standing among them. Right? So how do you process that? Was there something about his person that made them uneasy? Were they still struggling to trust their eyes? right? Am I trusting my eyes? Am I having some sort of bad vision, right? This is really him. So there's something definitely lacking. Now, but here, he doesn't take us into, even though he lists these seven individuals who are there, he doesn't go into them other than just Peter and John a little bit, right? But think about Peter when he comes to this event, okay? Now, if you, if you want to write some of these down so that you can go back and look at them again, Peter had a pretty rough road to get where we are right here, okay? If you want to look back, the first one starts in chapter 13 and verse 8. This one is that famous setting where Jesus starts to wash everybody's feet, right, in chapter 13. Peter's a little uh, freaked out uh, in terms of, Lord, you can't wash my feet. That's inappropriate to do that. Um, But what's the dark side of that is he presumed to tell the Lord what was appropriate for him to do. Think about that. Jesus, this is inappropriate for you. I'm sorry I have to instruct you about that. Now, he didn't think of it that way. That was a pretty embarrassing moment. And Jesus confronts Peter and says, Peter, right, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me, Peter. You don't understand what it means to follow me. Right, that was a pretty embarrassing moment for Peter who thought he was speaking in appropriate ways, humbling himself for the Lord. But in reality, underneath that humble request not to be washed by Jesus was his pride at work telling Jesus what's appropriate for him to do. Well, that's a pretty bad setting. Well, how about another one? Uh, back in chapter 18, uh, ch- chapter 13 again, again, where he professed in chapter 13, verses 38 and 39, that he professed his undying commitment to Jesus. Jesus, if everybody else, you know, cuts and runs, you can count on me, Jesus. I'll be with you to the end. Well, that that sounds pretty foolish about right now, chapter 13. Then you come to chapter 18, where Jesus is arrested. And Peter doesn't get it, right? Peter's the one who pulls out his little short sword, which he had on him. And Malchus, we know his name because John gives us, he pulls out the little short sword and whacks off uh, Malchus's ear and probably a little hunk of skin that went with it, right? Uh, and he wasn't trying to do some cute little thing. He was trying to kill the man. He was trying to defend Jesus, and of course, Jesus rebukes him again. 
I mean, Peter feels like, you know, wherever he steps, it's, it's the only thing that's consistent about where he steps is his foot winds up in his mouth, right? His foot winds up in his mouth every time he does it. And, and in these bold things, after a while, you'd get a little unsure of yourself. You know, every time I try to step out, Jesus, it seems like you, you whack me for it, right? So you get a little unsure of yourself. Well, then, of course, in chapter 18, right, again, in, in verses 15 to 18, he denies Jesus. He denies Jesus. Now, John doesn't give us the same details that Luke does, for example, but we do know that, that when Peter denied Jesus, Jesus and, and him locked eyes. And so he starts off first in 15 to 18, he denies, then in 25 to 27, has two other people right there at the same thing. Hey, aren't you a follower of Jesus? No. Wait a minute, right? The guy that was related to Malchus sees him and goes, hey, aren't you a follower of Jesus? No, 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 not me. So Peter, right, by the time you get here, and then to top it all off in chapter 20, he comes to the empty tomb, and I mentioned this before, he comes to the empty tomb, he walks in, and he remains ambivalent about what he saw. John sees and believes in verse 10, but Peter just comes in and looks, and he notices, but he doesn't respond. So I, I don't know. I don't know what's going through Peter's head, but, but if I were uh, thinking about some things here, here's some of the things that I would think about. Okay, and I, I want you to think about as a follower of Jesus when you really failed him. When you really failed him. I have some moments in my life that apart from the grace of God to extend his grace backward over those memories, they're hard to live with in my failures. And here I want you to think about kind of things that go through your head and if you think about Jesus. So maybe this one here. And some of us look back on our lives and regrets. There is no way God could forgive me for what I've done. There's no way. I mean, I've, I've turned my back on him. I've made a mockery. I've professed that I'm going to follow him. There's no way. Or how about this one? I'm such a failure. There's simply no way Christ could want me, let alone use me to lead. I'm such a failure. God, how? Do you have any time? How about this one? No one botched it as badly as I did. None of the others are as bad as I am. Right? Look at me, I'm a fool. How about this one? Look, look at the mess I've made. I turned out to be a big chicken. I turned out to be a big chicken. I abandoned Christ when he needed me most. I let my brothers down. I'm useless and a disgrace. Maybe it ended this way. Christ has to be ashamed of me. I certainly would be. He has to be ashamed of me. So I think in this moment, Peter is probably full of self-pity, probably some self-loathing and some real shame. And he's taking his brothers right into it, right? Um, this is one of the settings here. He's to be the leader of them in following Jesus, and he's being the leader in terms of taking them into his own depression, right? He's the Eeyore leading them all into their Eeyore day. So what happens then? Here's what happens. So Jesus comes to them, verses 1 through 3. He comes to them. Jesus goes where they are. This is the interesting thing. Jesus goes where they are. And the disciples are wandering off, and Jesus goes after them. And here is the question that comes to us, right? Are we wandering? Right? Are we wandering? Are we wandering off in our commitment to Christ? Are we wandering off in his call upon our lives? And we all do, right? We love that song that we often sing, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. And why is it that it resonates? Because it's true. It's true. And day after day, so are, are you wandering? So Jesus pursues them in their doubt. He knew that they needed more exposure to him. They needed more contact. They needed more proof of the resurrection. They needed more assurances that he's the one that's walking around them, is the one that they had been following all those three years, right? This is the same Jesus. He knows them. His mercy is evident in him bearing with them. 
He knows that, that this is a lot to take in as we've talked about before. I think Jesus, right, as we read about our God, which is so good, our our God knows our frame. He knows your capabilities. He knows your weaknesses, right? He knows how difficult this is for us and our our just limited, finite minds to accept the truths of God's greatness, of his goodness. And so Jesus condescends. He comes down because he knows it's it's too hard to believe for many people. and, And for some, it's just too good to believe. It's too hard. It's too good. I, I, I don't know. So he comes after them. And so Jesus, he's at the shore already, and he knows that they're out on the lake. He pursues them. They don't pursue him. Okay, now we come to verses 4 to 14. I think this is such an intriguing little part here. This is where Jesus, right, he comes to them. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. So he calls out to them. And there's a term of endearment here. Um, It's translated friends here. It could be used that way, but it's just children, right? And what he does is that he makes their labors, which had had been fruitless, he makes them fruitful. And one of the things that, that if you realize in John is we're trying to get a picture that Jesus really is the coming king. That Jesus is the one who eventually will establish God's rule and bring in flourishing and put away the curse. Jesus is that person. And when Jesus comes and does miracles like he does here, he doesn't just demonstrate his power, he demonstrates his generosity and his abundance. And so when you were back in the the very first of his signs back in chapter 2 when he created the the wine from the water, it's not only that he just made, you know, he didn't buy the, you know, the cheap wine that you would get, you know, at the groceries, at the uh, gas station, right, that's available for whatever. Jesus creates this wonderful wine and then he creates it in such abundance, right, six 30-gallon jars of it. And it speaks to the the abundance and the flourishing that's associated with Jesus. And that's why I think the number, people have wondered about why 153. I think John's just saying exactly how many fish they were, there were, and that they were large fish, and it was a huge haul, and that Jesus provided in abundance. And the the picture of this, this shepherd who doesn't just let the sheep exist, but he wants them to come to the fullness of life. He wants them to enter into the effectiveness that only he can bring when he's rightly put in their lives. And so he illustrates his good intentions and how important he is for their flourishing. Right? Now notice, now I love this picture here because in any of, uh, any of um, the moms in here know this, right? Uh, the moms, who, some of those who have tended to us with food, and with an environment for us to rest in. Jesus doesn't come in and start haranguing them. This is one of the things here. If it were you or me, in light of everything that Jesus has done, the surprise about this whole scene is that Jesus is just not indignant. You idiots. What is wrong with you guys? What do I have to do? I mean, what do I have to do? I mean, I went up on the cross. You all saw me there, right? Okay? And I came out of the tomb. How many times have I been going to see you? You guys are idiots. How long do I have to put up with you to do that? Right now, I'm saying this as a follower of Jesus. How many of us have done that with other followers of Jesus? How many times are I going to have to tell you the same thing? And here, Jesus, he's not indignant. He doesn't come and harangue them. And you would think if anybody would have grounds to harangue them for, for di- disconnecting from what's going on, you'd think it would be Jesus. But instead, he comes in. And, and there's something that's very interesting about this scene that, that stuck me for the first time is that Jesus already has fish and bread on the fire. Did you notice that? He didn't need their fish to feed them, but they needed to bring their fish. Right? Jesus is teaching them that their labors are a part of his blessing to them, of him giving them things to do. They needed to bring their fish, but he didn't need them to feed them. But what he wanted to do was something much more deeper, is to teach them something about him. Right, to call them into the life of service. So Jesus, we get a picture here of something that's consistent all the way through. Jesus is, is always throughout, he's initiating contact with his disciples. He's initiating contact, right? Do you, do you believe, and I, I do, do you believe that Jesus every day is trying to initiate contact with you as your shepherd? One of the things I I know I've shared with you before, but I pray for my family, I pray for the people that are in my sphere of influence, 
As I've said, I pray for my kids every day. One of the things I pray for them, I pray that they will give God space in their day. Will you, will you, God, turn their heart to you? Will you make them remind of your presence and of your goodness today? Would you, would you just uh, encourage them to make space for you today? Jesus is always going, he's initiating the relationship with them because he wants to draw them not just to life, but into it fully. And so Jesus is doing the same thing today. As the witness of the gospel is going out, the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done, the spirit of God is at work and if you're here and you've heard the gospel and you never respond to it, you're, you're resisting the work of Jesus by his spirit. In the same way, he goes into his disciples' lives like he's going to do Peter. And he's going to say, follow me. Don't follow that. Don't follow that. Don't give in to that. Follow me. That's what he's going to be doing day after day. And I, I want you to think of this idea. Jesus is trying to claim, this is the crazy thing, he's trying to claim every square inch in your soul. Every square inch. And I think what he's trying to teach Peter here is that Peter, yes, he does love Jesus, but his love isn't complete. His love isn't full, right? His love is half-hearted. And so he wants to get here. All right, now, verses 15 to 18. Now, this is uh, one of my favorite passages to come in to think about this. Um, as a parent or somebody that you've been with, somebody you love, um, one of the sweetest things that parents do, and this is hard to do, is if you get a child who's disobedient, a child who is doing things that, that you know is harmful for them, one of the hardest things to do and the loving things to do is you, you, you put them in front of you and you dig into them till they get it. You don't fly off the handle and shove them out because you're after them understanding the darkness that's going on that's caused this event. And you're talking to them and say, we need to understand it. And at the end of it, we need to recognize that we've sinned against God and then we need to apologize to the people that we've hurt. And that kind of moment, that's a hard moment. You will have people rage, you'll have people get mad, you'll have people uh, shut down, you'll have all those kinds. But this kind of a loving approach, and when I think about this moment, I think about in times that I've been caught in sin, Think about times where things have owned me. And Jesus is there going, Greg, do you love me? Jesus, you know I love you. Greg, what are you doing? Where are you going? Come on, Greg, do what I called you to do. So this is what Peter, this is what Jesus is doing. And so Jesus' questions gently probe Peter to get him to examine his love. It's character and it's depth right? Jesus had repeatedly taught him, if you want to read this a little bit later on, the characteristic of love of Jesus is what? John 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Right? Now, I want to say this to men here in, in particular, this love that Jesus is talking about, this is not romantic love, right? Sometimes uh, our songs at times uh, cast a vision of as if there's some romantic relationship we have with Jesus, and I, I don't, I don't uh, think that that's all. This is the kind of affection and commitment to Jesus that fits who he is and what he's done. Right? This is the kind of commitment that Paul would talk about. This is the kind of love that your life would become in light of all the mercies of God. You can read about it in Romans 12. In light of all the mercies of God, what should be my response to Jesus? A living sacrifice. That's what he's talking about here. It, you no know, holds barred commitment. I mean, this is, this is the knight who's serving the sovereign who just says, whatever you want, sovereign, I'll do. And his fealty to his Lord is demonstrated by his service, right? And so Peter here, right, he's not doing what the Lord called him to do. And the Lord knows that his commitment is half-hearted. He knows he's not obeying what he's told him to do. And so he wants him to see it for himself. Right? And this is the, t t if you remember about the, the uh, resurrection appearances of Jesus in chapter 20, what's the, what's, the, what's the interesting thing about it? He never identifies himself. That's what's so funny, right? When, when Mary's in the, in the garden, he, he says, Mary, who are you looking for? And, and you're saying, well, Jesus, why don't you just say, it's me, Mary, it's Jesus. But he doesn't do that. He says, who are you looking for? He wants her to come to the truth of his identity on her own. 
And here, he could tell Peter, he could walk in and say, Peter, this half-hearted commitment that you're making to me ain't working. Right? He could do that. Instead, he wants Peter to come to his own awareness of the fact that his life is broken, that his love is half-hearted. So he probes him. So he's getting him to recognize that he does not love him without reserve, that he does not love him exclusively and above all else. He wants Peter to be honest with himself. So, here's Peter. He's drifted, right? He hasn't owned his own lack of trust in the Lord or his lack of affection for Christ. The difficulties of the recent past that surrounded Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection have put Peter into the fire of testing. The impurities in his love for Jesus have been boiled to the surface. His weak faith, his impure love, they've all been exposed, right? He was big bravado, but boy, when the, when the heat came, right, the reality of where his heart was just got boiled right to the surface, right? We all know the difference of that. It's easy when you're sitting at EBC to voice your commitment to Christ is another challenge for you to be the husband and wife that Christ calls you to be in this kind of crucible of your family. It's another thing to be at work and to have an identity with Christ. It's another thing to be at school and to say, I follow Jesus and identify with him. It's another thing to be in a place where it's not going to be received well, where you say, no, 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 I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to represent him. I don't care what else happens today, but at the end of this day, I want to know that I've been faithful to Jesus. That's what I want to know. So it's easy, right, in the confines of where we are. It's expected of you to do that. But outside, it's not expected. And Peter, he needed the pressure to reveal to himself for his own good. And, and if you want to see this in terms of our study in James, Jesus is saying, Peter, God by his work has exposed you to yourself. And now that you see yourself in the mirror of my teaching, don't walk away and ignore what you've seen. Right? James is the whole thing. The word of God comes and reveals to who you are. Don't be the guy who looks in the mirror and then just ignores it and then walks off. You know, as you become aware, right, in your own, if you're a, a high school student and you go to school and then as soon as somebody puts you in, in, a, in, a, in a corner and you have to identify with Jesus and you bail on him, let that teach you about where your soul is with Jesus. Don't make some sort of excuse about, now, well, you understand all the risks. And don't make an excuse. You know whether you bailed or not. You know. So you need to pay attention to it. Pay attention. That's God's mercy because he wants to draw you into this deep relationship with him for your flourishing and blessing. Right? If you find yourself hedging while you're at work, if you find yourself, right, that you can talk a good game when you're here, but as soon as you get with your people out there and you're over here, all of a sudden, the Christian person that uses all this nomenclature and talks about these things, out there, people don't even know you that way. Then you need to think about that. Because God in his mercy is saying, I, I want you to know me fully. I want you to know the blessing of following me. My path is the path of love and blessing. This two-sided place he doesn't want us to be in. So all this picture is about Jesus loving Peter toward what Peter needs, right? And I say this here, Jesus already has fish and bread. He wants us to add ours. He didn't need the fish and the bread. Peter needed to be someone who was bringing, right, his acts of service and blessing to Jesus. That's what he needed to be. Now, what happens then in verse 19? Let's move on here a little bit. Jesus said to this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Now, one of the things I, I want you to think about here is uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, these three different requests. I think that the story-wise, it's pretty clear that Jesus is dealing with the three denials. Three denials. So it's three questions, right? I don't think there's much to be gained. There's different word that's used for love and, and the final request. I don't think uh, there's any real uh, hay to be made by that by, uh, from John. But he's just asking this question over and over again. And as Jesus appeals to him, he asks, and it's not that Jesus needs to know the answer. Peter needs to deal with the question. Okay? Peter needs to deal with the question. 
And it's a question we should, you know, do you love Jesus more than, right? When it says these, this is one of the things, more than these, more than what? More than the former self-directed life. More than the life that, that you get to set its parameters and say how it goes, and then you co-op you co Jesus to bless it. And Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love that self-directed life more than me? Or are you going to follow me? Right, there's only two options. There's a self-directed life. No matter whoever you let lead yourself, it's you ultimately determining who's going to lead you. And then there's the following life. So Peter, do you love me more than these? More than that self-directed life? Do you love me more than that, Peter? He says, Lord, you know. And Jesus does know, right? But it's not that Jesus needs to know Peter's heart. Peter needs to know his own heart. He needs to know his own heart. And I, I want to say you this, this here. This is one of the things that comes to me here. We often, sometimes in the Christian sphere, we often interact with God as if we need to tell him the states of our heart like he doesn't know, right? And like we could hide certain things from him. And sometimes we go to God and we say the things that we think God would want us to say, right? Other times we just don't go to him at all as if, as long as I don't speak, God doesn't know that I'm really upset with him or angry or about what thing's going on. Jesus knows your heart. His love is trying to help you own the darkness that's in it and bring you to life. That's what he's trying to do, and that's what he's trying to do with Peter. Now, the interesting thing here is what he's telling Peter, right, is the essence of love. Well, Peter, if you do love me, then what? Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. And these are all different ways to saying, Peter, do what I've called you to do. Peter, if you love me, do what I've called you to do. Peter, I've called you, right, to be a shepherd. Peter, I've called you. So Peter, do it. If you love me, Peter, then you'll do what I want to do. And here's what he's making us aware of. All your protestations about your love for Jesus are demonstrated, their depth and their character is demonstrated in your obedience or lack thereof. The depth of your love for Jesus shows up in your obedience. And for all of us, our obedience often is inconsistent with our protestations. Right? And so Jesus is pointing him to that and saying, Peter, if you love me, you would be doing what I ask you to do. Right? If you loved me, young person, your dating life would reflect my values sexually. If you loved me, it would affect the way you're spending your money. If you loved me, it would change the way you talk about your neighbor. If you loved me, you would make space for me in your life. If you loved me, you would reckon with the sin that you're wrestling with, and you would go all out like Jesus said. You'd pluck your eyes out to figure out some way to get free from it. If you love me, right, love will impale action, right? So any, any wife or husband here, Right? You know the difference, right? You can have statements of love. This is the old joke about Valentine's rolling around. Nobody wants a great bouquet on Valentine's if it's backed up by a whole year of neglect. Okay, I got a great bouquet. Yeah, but I just wish he would keep his word. Yeah, I just wish he would come home when he promised to. I just wish he would keep his commitments here. I just wish he would give some time for his family. I just wish uh, he would do this. Well, nobody cares about having a blowout Valentine's Day on, on a whole year's worth of neglect, right? And the same thing we can say about us for Jesus. Jesus is not interested in a blowout Sunday if Monday through Saturday looks like I don't know you, Right? Now, I'm speaking for myself. I'm speaking for this. I know the pool, right, in the mundane things of life to put Jesus on the back burner, to have Jesus out there to justify things that I'm engaged in somehow. And so Peter is just, Jesus is talking to him and saying, okay, follow me, Peter. If you love me, you follow me. Now, here in verse 19, this is the kind of thing where Peter, I think he tells this to Peter because he wants to talk about the nature of what following means, Right? For many of us, right, we want to establish the terms of what it means to follow. We don't do this with any other human being, right? Any other human being, whether it's a pastor here, whether it's some sort of character, political figure, whatever, there should be no person, no human being that we f follow in an unqualified way. 
Because everything that we do is underneath God's call on our life. The only person that we follow in an unqualified way is Jesus. And this is what he's getting after. This is what he's getting after with Peter because he jumps, which is the oddest thing, right after Jesus, you know, it's the oddest thing if he was sitting here right here with you and he says, Ian, I want you to follow me. And Ian goes, you know, Lord, I love you. And then immediately he tells Ian how he's going to die. Uh, Jesus, that's really odd, right? Why don't you talk about, you know, my life from here on out? Like, what's going to happen, right? Give me some positive things. Jesus, I came to church today to feel good about myself, right? And that's, that's a little disconcerting, right? And Jesus doesn't, right, for the majority of us, tell us anything like that. But with Peter, he tells him right off, and he does it obliquely, but Peter knows. He says, you know, if you're young, you're going to get to decide where you want to go, but when you get old, you're going to get arrested, and people are going to take you places you don't want to go, and we know what happens to Peter. He gets crucified upside down. He's going to get killed for his faith in Jesus, right? And so he's talking about a kind of following that's a no-holds-barred, fully committed. This is the whole thing that, you know, we talked about as we went through the whole COVID thing. It is not the Christian's uh, foremost concern. Safety is not first. Faithfulness is first. Faithfulness is first. The only safe place to be, the only flourishing place to be is in obedience to Jesus. And so he says, you got to follow me. Well, the kind of following is, is you got to follow me even though it's going to take you to your death to be faithful to me. Right? And you see that Peter, right, as we're reading, Peter doesn't like that. Right? Peter's still, he's still struggling with the idea that you mean, Jesus, I don't get to define what it means to follow you? Meaning I don't get to, you know, have a look at a line item veto on a couple things? Jesus, why don't you give me like an option of like one, two, and three and let me pick one? Or Jesus, here, I got a great idea. This is what we often do in our own. Jesus, I got a great idea. How about you just, you just help me make this dream happen? And Jesus says, no, no, the only way you're going to know life is that if you have a commitment to me that's no holds barred and you trust me to take you wherever you want to go. And you know he does it, he's wrestling with it because he immediately, right, he sees John standing behind him and he goes, hey, what about him? What about this guy? Right? The whole idea is, that's not fair. That's not fair. What kind of, what kind of, what kind of encouraging note is that, Jesus? Right? So John's over there, and Jesus basically turns to Peter and says, that's none of your business. That's none of your business. That's between him and me. I mean, how many times as a Christian you said, Lord, why do I have to have a chronic illness? Why did I have to have the crappy family I grew up in? Why did I have to have someone that I think we started off really well, and now they've bailed on Jesus? Lord, why me? Why these reversals? Why these difficulties? Right? Jesus, come on. Why, why, why don't I have this? Why, why didn't I get the kind of body and, and talents that I could go viral somewhere? Why didn't I get that? Or why didn't you give me those things? And, and here's the, just Jesus' word to all of us is, okay, follow me, period. Follow me, Period. Follow me, period. And in case you need to know why you should follow me, read the rest of the book. Read the rest of the book, because I'm the person that when I come, I bring abundance and peace. When I come into a person's life, I provide guidance and protection because I'm a shepherd. And I provide the only way out from underneath the curse that you're in because I'm the door to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the vine through which all of life comes to you through. I'm the one that has loved you to the uttermost and have done everything to rescue you from the darkness that you truly face. There is nothing that will separate you from my love. And I've given you everything. Follow me. Stop questioning Stop complaining. Follow me. I know the best way for you to go. That's what he's telling to Peter. Right? John lets us in on a little, little misunderstanding, right? Everybody says, well, he said that John was going to live until he returned. And John has to clarify, no, no, he didn't say that. Right? It's pretty important to get what Jesus says right. Okay? And you know what? When Jesus said, follow me, he didn't mean that you're not going to have a disease. He didn't mean that things are all going to go perfect as the world will look at it. He didn't mean that you would be the most popular, powerful person. 
He meant that you'll know life and know it to the full. That's what he said. That's what he said. And he says, follow me. Follow me. So let me give you a couple things here in concluding thoughts. If you want to fill in your blanks, if you're a blank filler, you say, is he ever going to get there? I did. Here we are. Okay, concluding thoughts. Here's one. Jesus' love for us is tenacious and unshakable. Right? I don't care how dark your day is today. His love is tenacious and unshakable. As we sang today, he will hold you fast. One, two. Jesus is always pursuing us to take us deeper into the life he has given us. He's always pursuing us. If you're bored, it's because you've neglected Jesus. If you feel that, that he's left somewhere, it's not because he's gone anywhere. It's just because you've, you've left him. Jesus is a savior who pursues Jesus, thirdly, puts us under pressure to boil the adulterous heart right out of us. Jesus puts us under pressure to boil the adulterous heart right out of us. Fourthly, Jesus knows we are all on the way. Jesus knows your limitations. He knows you're on the way. All of us love some of these more than him. I don't know what it is, right, that we want to hold on to, that we don't want to surrender to the Lord, or we're afraid that if we do, somehow he's going to take the thing that we want. But some of all of us do. Our loves are disordered, and our love for him is weak. It's tepid. It's faltering. It shows up in our lack of obedience. You know, there's always a discussion, especially on the college level, about the Lord's will for me. You know, what's the Lord's will? Right? And, of course, one of the responses all the time is, um, I don't know. That's my, that's my, that's my uh, considered opinion. I don't know. I mean, what is the Lord's will for you in terms of your vocation? Well, it seems like you've got an aptitude for this one. It seems like this fits you, these kind of things like that. But really, is this, uh, I can't speak of it as a calling, like God has from eternity past destined that you will be a nurse, Right? Uh, so that you will save the lives of many. I don't know that. And God's not going to say. And in all my uh, career that I'm in right now, I never had something right, written in the skies. Greg, teach at Cedarville. Never had that happen. That would have been nice uh, to know that. Especially if the people that hired me had read the same message, right? Uh, but I never had those kind of things. Uh, I never had any kind of, I've had moments, most of them in retrospect, where I look back and say, man, it was pretty evident that God was shaping those things. Occasionally, I've had those moments in ahead of time. But that always distracts us. That kind of thinking distracts us from what the core call of scriptures is, is to know Jesus and walk with Jesus. I know that that's his will. Every day, to listen to him, talk to him, pay attention to him, do what he's called me to do. I don't know what platform it's necessarily going to be on. And I don't even know if I get on a platform, how long he will let me be on that platform. I could train my whole life to get into a particular platform and God could say, I'm not going to let you want it because I want you to go through something that you didn't plan. But I do know what he wants me every day. Turn to him, walk with him. And then next year, Jesus wants us to come to him and to let go of our foolish attempts to dictate to him how we should go to come to him and let go of our foolish attempts to dictate, to trust in his loving provision and direction, period. Braden and Megan, will you come and lead us in our last song? And then I want to follow up a benediction as we end. Uh, I want to think today, what is Jesus wanting you to let go of, to reaffirm, to stop wandering today. Come back. Megan, Braden.